there. Welcome to this Vice News live stream. My name is Carter Sherman and I'm a reporter with Vice News. I am joined today by three experts to talk about the latest vacancy on the Supreme Court that was created by the death of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg on Friday. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has vowed to fill that seat before a new president has been installed. And President Trump has vowed numerous times to install only pro-life justices on the Supreme Court. So I am joined today to talk about what, about what those kind of consequences of that may be. Uh, we have Mary Ziegler, who is a professor at the Florida State University. She specializes in the legal history of reproduction. We also have Mira Shaw, who is an abortion provider, the chief medical officer at Planned Parenthood Hudson Peconic, and the author of a new book, You're the Only One I've Told, The Stories Behind Abortion, as well as Gretchen Bors Borsop, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Gretchen, please correct me, who is the Vice President of Reproductive Rights and Health at the National Women's Law Center. The National Women's Law Center has already started mobilizing its supporters to block that new justice from being installed before the new president. Um, so first of all, thank you all so much for agreeing to chat with me and all of our viewers about this. And to the viewers, if you have any questions or comments, please feel free, feel free to put those into our little chat box here and we may be able to address some of them. So I wanted to start by opening up a question to the group, which is if you support abortion rights, if you support Roe v. Wade, the 1973 Supreme Court decision that legalized abortion nationwide, how dire is this vacancy and Mitch McConnell's promise to fill it? Ooh, can I start? <laughs> okay, so it is dire. Let me tell you, everything is on the line right now for abortion. President Trump promised to nominate only Supreme Court justices who would overturn Roe versus Wade. He already delivered with two of them, right? Two of them already disregarded longstanding precedent, voted against abortion rights in a case that came out just in July. That decision was five to four and Ginsburg was in the majority. So if we have another justice who is opposed to abortion rights, the balance is gonna shift. And that could mean the court is gonna overturn Roe versus Wade explicitly, or it's gonna deliver its death by a thousand cuts and basically make it impossible for anybody to obtain. And so it everything is on the line right now. I can't overstate how real the threat is. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think that uh, the threat to Roe was pretty real to begin with. Um, Chief Justice Roberts had been the kind of swing vote on abortion until now, but he wasn't much. I think calling him a swing vote exaggerates how likely he was to vote for abortion rights. Um, and now we'd be looking potentially at having Brett Kavanaugh be the swing vote on abortion rights, which again is not really that's not saying much, right? So I think we've moved to um, almost a, a near certainty that Roe will be either overturned or um, eviscerated if we have another conservative justice on the court. I think everyone understands that. And as, as a physician and not a policy expert, I can say that I have seen firsthand um, what abortion access looks like currently. Um, in various parts of the country. And, you know, when you say death by a thousand cuts, um, I've seen people be able to access abortion care very freely without restriction in New York State. And then I've also seen people have to go through hoops and hurdles and essentially uh, Herculean efforts to obtain abortion care in places like Indiana and Texas. So if we were to chip away at access, if we were to see access being chipped away even more, um, it will be a disaster and it will be harmful to people all over the country. Um, and we, we, we just can't see that happen. Yeah, Mira, I'd love to discuss that a bit more. As you said, you provided abortions in New York. You've provided them in Texas and Indiana, which are much more opposed to abortion, have many more restrictions on abortion. Can you kind of give a portrait of how different trying to get an abortion might be in Texas and Indiana with the existing restrictions versus going somewhere like New York, which is much more liberal. Practice in New York State, um, where there are no waiting periods. And when I mean waiting periods, I mean that an individual can make an appointment at a health center in the morning, come to the health center that afternoon, um, 
receive the the you know the counseling component of the of the visit and then obtain the abortion that they need. Um, the Medicaid, so public insurance, will cover the cost of the abortion as well as private insurance. Um, An ultrasound is not mandated, but is oftentimes used to aid in the diagnosis of a pregnancy to determine exactly how far along somebody is. Now, this is in stark contrast with the way abortion care is delivered in Indiana and in Texas. So I currently fly once a month to Indiana to provide abortion care not in the past few months because of COVID, which I can talk about a little bit later, but in Indiana, um, an individual cannot use their public insurance. They can't use their private insurance. They have to pay out of pocket. Um, so I've literally seen, literally seen patients take out dollar bills to count out um, the money that is needed to pay for essential health care. Um, in Indiana, patients have to wait 18 hours before obtaining the abortion. So they come in, they get a they have a counseling visit and uh, an ultrasound is mandated they're also required to get a description of the ultrasound they're also required to see a an image um like a cartoon image of um what the fetus looks like um that corresponds to the number of gestational weeks that they are they're also required to listen to a script of not always factual information so information that says things like there's a link to depression or regret um, and abortion, um, which is not based in science. It's all based in junk science that the anti-abortion um, movement um, draws from. Um, after the patient receives this counseling visit, they are then to go home and come back at least 18 hours later to receive either the procedure or the pills um, to have the abortion. In Texas, there are very similar laws um, the waiting period is 24 hours. In Missouri, it's 72 hours. Um, in other places, it's 48. Um, and the scripts are similar, although they slightly vary. In Texas, the healthcare provider is, um, the physician is mandated to say that there's a link between breast cancer and abortion, which I will tell you is not true. Um, as a scientist, as a physician, that is just not true. Um, but that is required by law to be said to the patient. Um, so the zip code in which you live really determines and dictates the type of care that you receive in this country. And it is incredibly unethical as abortion is a human right um, and it is essential health care. So, oh, go ahead, Gretchen. All you. I'm going to say, you know, Dr. Shaw illustrates on such a personal level what it means for people, but the reason it's like that is a result of this chipping away at row that we've seen over the years and state legislators who are doing everything that they can to put abortion out of reach for people. So in the last decade, we've seen under over 450 abortion restrictions passed by state legislatures. And that's creating this system that Dr. Shaw described, where people have different restrictions depending on where you live. They have all these burdens and hurdles thrown in their way. So already the right to abortion is meaningless for so many in this country, especially people of color, people who are struggling financially, people who live in rural areas. And what we're talking about is the court basically making that true for everybody in this country and taking that right to abortion away. Um, you know, the right is meaningless if you can't access it. So whether they formally overturn Roe or basically eviscerate it, it could mean the end of abortion in this country. On that note, why have we seen so many restrictions on abortion in the last decade or so? What has changed in this country that has led to so many restrictions being passed at the state level? Um, I, I think in part, uh, there was a big spike after the, the Tea Party wave in 2010. Um, so there were, there always, there have been abortion restrictions going back to Roe, basically. There was, um, the National Right to Life Committee held a meeting the, in February of 1973 about abortion restrictions. So the, the abortion restrictions are not new. Um, I think in part what you see is that there was a wave of Republican legislators who took over state houses, state senates, and um, governor's mansions in 2010, and that caused abortion restrictions um, to skyrocket. And you saw another kind of big explosion after the nomination of Brett Kavanaugh to the Supreme Court, because at that time, probably correctly, many people assumed that you would already have a conservative majority willing to roll back abortion rights. And I think now, obviously, with one more 
um, conservative justice, there's almost an insurance policy, right? So if someone like uh, Chief Justice Roberts, for example, had second thoughts because of concerns about backlash or damage to the court's reputation, you have, you know, an, it wouldn't matter anymore, right? Like, so if there's one conservative justice who jumps ship, that isn't enough uh, to save Roe, you would need, you know, two or three or something that becomes increasingly improbable. But I think there's a direct correlation between Supreme Court nominations and abortion restrictions, because those restrictions are all designed to go to the Supreme Court um, and give the court enough, uh, multiple opportunities to revisit Roe when it wants to. Decision from July, June Medical, where Chief Justice Roberts joined with Ginsburg and others to preserve the right to abortion and strike down this Louisiana law. But what's often overlooked is that Chief Justice Roberts did that because he does care about legitimacy of the court. And he, they literally heard the exact same case just a few years earlier. So to come out another way would have been unprecedented and really broken the rule of law, right? So he was bound to, to be where he was. But in his decision that he wrote, he basically gave a roadmap to anti-abortion opponent or legislators saying, bring me a different case. Bring me a case that isn't the exact same case that we heard just a few years earlier, and we will come out a different way. We'll change the standard by which you uh, analyze abortion restrictions. We will make it so that abortion is not the way it is now, but we will restrict access. So he has now offered this roadmap, and we're already starting to see lower court judges taking him up on that roadmap. And we're going to see when the state legislatures come back into session in January, we're going to see them taking him up on that, too. Yeah, and I think another important point is that uh, adding one more conservative opens up more dramatic possibilities because, of course, um, we we all talk about Roe v. Wade, right? Roe v. Wade is the sort of at the epicenter of what we talk about. But f for the anti-abortion movement, it, the anti-abortion movement wasn't organized around Roe v. Wade. It predated Roe v. Wade. It was organized around the idea of a right to life. So it, it, the goal eventually will be to come back to a conservative enough Supreme Court and argue that there's a right to life. And in practical terms, that would mean um, that you would have a nationwide abortion ban. Overturning Roe, of course, sends things back to the states, which would mean that you would pr presumably have abortion access to some degree in blue states and not have it in red states and maybe have it be contested in purple states. Um, but that won't be the end of the discussion. There will be an effort to get a constitutional right to life. And that would mean and that that becomes increasingly likely, right? Adding more and more conservatives to the court opens the door to that possibility much more. So I when you're saying an ad that, uh, if I can just clarify something there, when you're saying a national right to life, does that mean the court saying a fetus is a person? When you're talking about the Supreme Court saying, you know, there is a national, there is a right to life and it should be national and we're going to ban abortion. Would that be the Supreme Court saying a fetus is definitively a person? Is that what you're talking that, about? It might be. I mean, it might be. There, there are different ways you could go about it. Um, and obviously for a long time, nobody even really took that seriously, right? There weren't anti-abortion lawyers really emphasizing that argument much because it wasn't gonna happen in a world where you had Roe v. Wade. But now that you seem to have a court willing to overrule Roe v. Wade, the next step would be, well, if is there a right to life and where does it come from? Some of the arguments are even based on things like international human rights law or the Declaration of Independence or originalism. Personhood is probably the single biggest argument. The idea would be that, you know, the framers meant to include fetuses or unborn children in the word person in the 14th Amendment. Um, but we'll probably see a lot more of that argument develop now because at least that possibility is on the table. And we've learned from the heartbeat bans of 2019 that um, when a more absolute outcome is possible, there will be anti-abortion lawyers and legislators who try to see if, if the court will go for it. So I would expect to see more of that coming. With that, there were a bunch of laws that were passed in states in 2019 that essentially banned abortion after about six weeks of pregnancy, before many people even know they're pregnant. Um, there are also some states like Alabama that passed essentially total abortion bans. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe those six week bans, those total abortion bans, they have been held up in court. They're not in effect anywhere. Um, 
they could get to the Supreme Court. As you said, they're designed to go up to the Supreme Court, give the Supreme Court a chance to look at abortion rights. Are we going to see that any time in the near future? What's the timeline on those cases showing up in front of the court? I don't think that's going to be the next case to reach the court. There are a bunch that are further along in the pipeline. So there are over a dozen cases that are in the pipeline, one step away from the Supreme Court, including actually a couple that are pending with the Supreme Court. Um, but the, those kind of outright bans are a little uh, lower down on the list. Although I think there's one from Mississippi that's a little bit of a later ban that is very close to the court. So I don't think we're going to see one of those right away. I think we're more likely to see one that allows the court to kind of you know, chip away at the edges unless they decide they want to turn that case into one that allows them to directly address Roe versus Wade, which could happen too, right? The court has a lot of power to decide how they address certain questions and, and where they, they set the boundaries. So we're going to have to wait and see. But one thing to, to note to your point, Carter, is that those bans were passed in the wake of Kavanaugh being appointed to the court and anti-abortion legislators saying, hey, now we have this new justice let's get these bans to the court. Now we have this opportunity to overturn Roe. And so with a conservative justice and anti-abortion justice replacing Justice Ginsburg, you can imagine the opportunity they're gonna see when that happens. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think we're likely to see a ban before the court that soon either. Um, I think, yeah, there, Mississippi has a 15 week ban that the court could decide to hear, but there are a lot of other issues. I think the court has the tools already in the law to allow them to roll back abortion rights without having to overturn Roe yet. And there are lots of fairly consequential laws that are pretty far along in the pipeline, including some the court could take, you know, literally next week, right, when they have the long conference. So um, we're talking about, you know, a process that could start imminently. Um, I'd love to talk about some of those cases, but I also wanted to bring up a case, Gretchen, you mentioned a case, cases that could be pending before the Supreme Court. There is a case right now that the Trump administration has asked the Supreme Court to weigh in on um, involving accessibility of medication abortion, specifically one of the pills that is used to induce an abortion. Uh, Mira, I don't know if you kind of want to walk through what a medication abortion is and what this drug is, what the regulations around it are or were in the middle of this pandemic. Yeah, so Mifepristone is what it's called, and it was FDA approved in 2000. And what it essentially does is it blocks the hormone that is needed and required for a pregnancy to thrive. So what it'll do is um, it, it it's a, it's a it's just one pill, and it's taken by the patient, and um, and it ends the pregnancy. There's another set of pills called misoprostol, which actually can be obtained um, from a pharmacy. Um, and those pills are used by the patient to then in, um, induce cramping and bleeding and expulsion of the pregnancy. Um, so the requirement now is that the, the, FDA, the FDA requires that, that Mifepristone be dispensed by a healthcare provider. Um, and so during COVID, for example, we were able to move the, many of our services to a telehealth platform. However, um, it, and, and we did this with medication abortion, however, our patients were still um, had to come to the health center to pick up the medications from us. Um, medication abortion is incredibly safe. Um, it has it, the safety profile um, is over 99%. In other words, the risk of bleeding um, or infection incredibly, incredibly low, but less than 0.5%. Um, and yet it is heavily regulated um, by the government um, unnecessarily. So Mifepristone, I believe is the only drug that's regulated by the FDA out of more than 20,000 drugs that you can get it, you can take it at home, but you have to go in person to pick it up. Is that correct, Mira, from your understanding? Yes, it is. It is the the labeling around the medication changed a couple of years ago. Um, that it, it used to be that we had to actually watch the patient swallow the pill, which is pretty invasive, um, and like in the health center. But now we can give the patient the pill to take home to initiate the abortion at a time that is most convenient for them. 
got it. Um, so I just want to introduce everybody again, as we may have new viewers. Uh, I was just speaking with Dr. Mira Shaw, who is an abortion provider, the chief medical officer at Planned Parenthood Hudson Baconic, and the author of a new book, You're the Only One That I've Told, Stories Behind Abortion. Uh, we are also joined by Mary Ziegler, who is a professor at Florida State University and specializes in the legal history of reproduction, and by Gretchen Borschelt, uh, keep on hoping I'm pronouncing that name right, <laughs> who is the vice president of reproductive rights and health at the National Women's Law Center. Um, Mary or Gretchen, would you kind of be able to talk about what the status is of that case involving medication abortion? I think the ACLU teamed up with some other uh, professional groups that represent OBGYNs to sue back in May. What is going on with that case now? Uh, could, when could the Supreme Court be expected to make some kind of decision on that? And what kind of decision could we see here? Oh, sorry, I was waiting to see if it was going to be me or Mary. <laughs> Go for it. Yeah, so that um, decision is pending before the court right now. So they are going to decide whether to take it up. And as, um, as you said, the Trump administration is petitioning them because at the lower court level, they blocked these attempts to restrict access to abortion, of telemedicine abortion. And so the, the court could take it up. And I think it's a real danger of this court taking it up and deciding in a bad way. And, you know, I think to the broader point and some of what um, Dr. Shaw was getting at is that right now we're in a public health pandemic and they're still trying to take healthcare access away from people, right? This is the exact opposite of what people need right now. People need more access to healthcare, not less. And so what we're seeing is, again, anti-abortion legislators taking advantage of a situation where they can say, oh, let's restrict abortion. And so we've seen a number of states just try and shut down clinics altogether. That was at the beginning of the pandemic when they tried to just completely shut down clinics. Those cases went to the court. Um, in Texas, it was going back and forth with the court saying, yes, clinics could reopen and then shutting them down again. And so it's creating a situation in this country where people are confused about what their rights are. Do they have the right to access abortion? Do they not? Is a clinic open? Is the clinic closed? Compounded by all the logistical difficulties of having to go and get care in the middle of a pandemic. So I think, you know, I, I, what I worry about is some of these cases that are pending and the discussion is just causing more confusion for people and might mean that people don't seek the care they actually right now are legally entitled to get because they don't know the status and think it already might be banned. I remember um, back when Alabama and Georgia and a bunch of other states passed either total abortion bans or six-week bans, I was talking to um, supporters of abortion rights in those areas, and they were just besieged by calls from people who thought that abortion had already been banned, that they were no longer able to get the abortion, um, which was incorrect. Those laws never really went into effect. Um, but speaking of those laws, speaking of those laws being made for the Supreme Court, what are, other than this FDA case, what are kind of the other cases that might be in front of the Supreme Court pretty soon? They, I think they believe, they start again on October 5th. Am I wrong about that? Time is now in the pandemic. Um, I think there's, as I was mentioning, there's a, a law from Mississippi that bans all abortions um, at 15 weeks. Uh, Mississippi has a petition before the court to hear that case so they could take that up. Um, there are cases relatively far down the pipeline involving bans on dilation and evacuation, which is the most um, safe and common procedure after the first trimester. Um, and the court could take that up too. And those are, I think, both more um, likely in a way than a, a heartbeat ban, uh, in part because they're built to expand on previous losses for abortion rights, particularly a case called Gonzalez versus Carhartt that involves so-called partial birth abortion. So um, the idea is always to give the court, in particular, some, some of the justices, like potentially Justice, Chief Justice Roberts or Justice Kavanaugh, who are worried about appearances, give them some kind of cover that precedent, this is an extension of precedent, or at least not um, you know, an outright refutation of precedent, while still scaling back significantly on abortion rights. And so there's a couple of cases pretty far down the pipeline that allow them to do that. There are others that I think are important in coming to, but not as close to the court. Why would Kavanaugh be the like quote unquote Supreme, like the, the swing justice on the bench? I 
would love to dive into that more. I don't think that that would yeah, be something I mean, that broadly. Sorry. I mean, I mean, it's not, I don't mean, I, when I say swing justice, I don't, it's not like a, <laughs> I mean, that, that's sort of misleading, right? Because swing justice makes it seem as if there's like a real chance the person could go either way. And that's probably not true. But if you, if you assume, so if Chief Justice Roberts joins the liberals, right, with an additional conservative on the court, that isn't going to matter anymore, because that would only get you to four. Um, so of the four justices this summer, who wanted to uphold or at least not strike down Louisiana's abortion restriction, Kavanaugh was the most cautious. So he wanted to send the case back for further development of the facts, you know, on the theory that even though these laws were identical, the, you know, the reality on the ground was different, which I mean is obviously, you know, not a great sign for supporters of abortion rights either, but at least Kavanaugh seems to have some concern about the timing in terms of being willing to, for example, overrule Roe v. Wade outright tomorrow, he might not be willing to do that. Whereas, for example, you had Clarence Thomas, you know, Clarence Thomas like literally never misses an opportunity to say the Constitution doesn't recognize the right to abortion. You have Neil Gorsuch, who right, whose dissent, um, if you know enough about the history of the pro-life movement, there were a lot of, you know, anti-abortion talking points in the dissent. Um, so, Justice Alito's opinion adopted pretty much wholesale the argument that abortion hurts women. So those three are definitely not going to be <laughs> the swing justice. Um, I mean, we don't know who President Trump's going to nominate and there are possibilities that that person might be um, less committed or more committed to overturning Roe, depending on who's selected. But I think of the four that are were the dissenters in June Medical, uh, Kavanaugh, to me, looks the most concerned about optics and therefore potentially the least, I mean, the, the closest to a swing vote. I don't really think he's a swing vote either. I can't call him a swing vote. I think he is, as you said, Mary, he's someone who cares about optics, but he will pretend that what he's doing is not harmful to abortion, but it absolutely is. It's kind of like a wolf in sheep's clothing. And so I actually think he's more dangerous, right? It's kind of like just a, a Chief Justice Roberts' concurrence in June Medical, which everyone was so relieved he joined the majority and joined the liberals to not strike, to not uphold this abortion restriction. But really, as I said, his decision gives us this roadmap for how to actually get a case to the court that would allow them to restrict abortion. So I think that I would put Kavanaugh in that category of he's absolutely committed to getting rid of abortion. He just wants to do it in a smart, strategic, not obvious way. Um, certainly he fooled Susan Collins during the confirmation hearing, right? And so um, he's smart and strategic and, and that can be more dangerous. Yeah, I mean, I think I totally agree with that. I think it's more a question of if you're thinking about if what you're thinking about is a big splashy decision saying Roe is overturned, I think that would be a tougher sell for a Kavanaugh or a Robert, because that isn't going to be easy from the standpoint of optics or politics, whereas the kind of stealth strategy would be. And so there are definitely, um, so if what we're thinking about is an explicit overturning of Roe, then Kavanaugh is probably the swing vote for that. If you're talking about something equally consequential but harder to understand, I, I don't think really I don't think Chief Justice Roberts is a swing vote for that. I don't think there is a swing vote for that. I think that's that's pretty much going to happen. <laughs> I think that's going down, as as the as the kids say today. Um, for viewers who might not know all of this history, uh, we referenced this case, June Medical Services v. Russo, a couple of times. This was a case that was argued back in March, um, pre-pandemic. It was. I went to arguments at the Supreme Court. It was the last time I was in a crowd. Uh, and then it was decided in late June, like one of the very last cases to be decided of the term. Uh, the case dealt with a abortion restriction out of Louisiana that required abortion providers to have what are known as admitting privileges at a local hospital. Um, Mira, I would love to ask you about these privileges in a second. Uh, but basically the case dealt with a law in Louisiana that was essentially identical to a law that had been enacted in Texas several years prior. That case, Whole Women's Health v. Hellerstadt, uh, the Supreme Court decided in 2016, and they decided to strike down that restriction. Um, and so in Justice Roberts' opinion, he explicitly said that he believed that Whole Women's Health had been wrongly decided, but because the Louisiana restriction was, again, essentially identical to the Texas one, 
he had to uphold the precedent of whole woman's health. Um, his opinion was then used, it was cited by some ju judges out of the Eighth Circuit in Arkansas to, uh, I think, strip away a preliminary injunction on several abortion restrictions in that state. And that case is still being argued, um, it's being handled by the ACLU. So those laws on admitting privileges, those are uh, called by abortion supporters as targeted regulations of abortion providers. And it's essentially the idea among abortion rights supporters is that they are holding uh, abortion providers to an unnecessary, a medically unnecessary standard. Um, Mira, I'd love if you could kind of talk a little bit about how those provisions have appeared in your work, have impacted your patients. Um, and you know, if you have, have fears of those kind of resurging. Yeah, definitely. So just to describe this whole concept of what an admitting privilege actually is. So basically, it's it's requiring physicians who provide abortion to have access and the ability and the privilege to admit a patient from their health center to the hospital in the event of emergency. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, as a healthcare provider who's worked in various settings, um, providing abortion care, the, the risk of a, of a complication from an abortion is incredibly low. So the, the times that we send somebody to an, to an emergency room or to a hospital for higher level care from a health center, is, it's, just, it's just so rare. So I just wanna put that out there because abortion is incredibly safe, complication rates are low, so hospital level care is rarely needed. Um, number two, the the patient if if they truly are in need of higher level care they're going to be seen regardless of if the if the physician has admitting privileges or not um because of a law called EMTALA there's a there's a requirement that hospitals have to see patients um if they are in urgent need of health care services um, so what this rule is essentially doing is making it really hard for abortion providers to be able to practice medicine. And that's the ultimate goal, because a lot of hospitals in conservative states are reluctant to give abortion providers um, admitting privileges because of the nature of their administrations. Many of them are Catholic hospitals, and there's a which is a separate issue, but an important one. That there's a there's a um, a movement towards Catholic Catholic hospitals merging with non-Catholic hospitals and taking them over, which then severely restricts the type of care that can be provided in the hospital setting, or the ability of a of an abortion provider to gain admitting privileges at those local hospitals. Um, but like I said, ultimately. Having those privileges is not, um, it's, you know, it, it's not necessary in order to provide safe abortion care for the patient. And one of the, and in this case, there was a, I, I contributed to an answer brief to the, for this case, because one of the arguments was that, well, abortion providers don't care about their patients, and this is why they don't want to have admitting privileges. And the exact opposite is true. No, we do care about our patients. We want to provide them with safe care. As a physician, I took an oath um, to first do no harm. And I, I actually think that requiring unnecessary hurdles to provide care is harmful. And, and, and as a physician, I also know that there's a lot of data, there's a lot of research to support what I'm saying. And, and support the work that myself and my colleagues are doing. I would add to that that there was um, a landmark study that came out in 2018 from the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine that basically overwhelmingly found that abortions in the United States are safe. It's kind of the, the top line finding there. Um, so I also wanted to circle back to something that Mary mentioned, which is uh, the possibility of having the Supreme Court take up a DNE case, a DNE ban. Um, Mary, can you kind of walk through what a DNE is, a dilation and evacuation is, and what a ban on that procedure would look like for patients? So a, a, a dilation and evacuation is a very safe um, procedure. It's a method of um, of ending a pregnancy that's like later second try. 
Um, it's incredibly safe. It's a technique that's done in a very compassionate, kind um, way that is based in evidence and science. Um, and but you know something about it makes anti-abortion people uncomfortable, and so they you know do everything they can to try and stop this procedure from happening. Um, it is, it's, it's. There's not much more I can say about it. They probably have a lot more to say about it than I do. Other than that, it's incredibly safe, and it's a really common procedure that is done um, to terminate a pregnancy. Um, and I think that many people don't even know that they are pregnant. It's very common for me to see people show up to um, the health center um, with a pregnancy that's maybe slightly further along than they even anticipated. And so DNA is needed. Um, and so restricting this procedure is one that could be really hurtful for a lot of patients and force birth upon people who do, you know, do not want to parent at that time. Um, I wanted to, to talk about the potential replacements for Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, before I do that, I'm gonna introduce all y'all again for any new viewers. Uh, so we have Dr. Mary Shaw, who is an abortion provider, the chief medical officer at Planned Parenthood Hudson Peconic. We have Mary Ziegler, who is a professor at Florida State University, and she specializes in the legal history of reproduction. And we have Gretchen Borschelt, who is the vice president for reproductive rights and health at the National Women's Law Center. Um, and Gretchen, this might be a question for you because the National Women's Law Center has already started to energize its supporters around trying to prevent uh, Mitch McConnell from filling Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg's uh, vacancy ahead of the election and potentially after it, which you can also discuss the kind of lame duck Senate implications here. Um, but what do we know about the potential replacements the names of the women who've been bandied around who may replace Justice Ginsburg? Well, what I think is the most important to know is that President Trump promised that any nominee is going to be committed to overturning Roe versus Wade. So it kind of doesn't even matter who the potential nominees are because they have that baseline commitment. He also promised to only nominate people who are committed to getting rid of the Affordable Care Act. And there's a case before the court. They're going to be hearing that oral argument literally the week after Election Day, whether to get rid of the Affordable Care Act. And Justice Ginsburg's um, death certainly affects that as an outcome, too. And you know, we're not talking about that case specifically, but obviously the Affordable Care Act has done so much for women and women's access to reproductive health care, in particular birth control and maternity care. So put that aside, um, I think the important thing is we are opposed to any nominee that President Trump would announce because of those two core commitments. Now, some names that are being bandied about, Amy Coney Barrett is one of the leading contenders that we've heard, and she has a very troubling record, especially on birth control access and allowing um, employers to make decisions for their employees about whether or not they get the birth control coverage that they're entitled to under the Affordable Care Act. Um, and she also has, you know, she hasn't been as out there in her decisions in terms of writing opinions on abortion, but she certainly has joined some troubling decisions on abortion. Uh, so we are very concerned about her, but as I said, we're concerned about anybody that Trump's going to nominate because of those core commitments to overturning Roe and the Affordable Care Act. Um, I don't know if anyone else wants to jump in on that, but I'm, I am wondering, uh, if not, um, you know, like what kind of support have you seen since Friday when Justice Ginsburg died? I understand that a lot of abortion rights supporting organizations have really seen like a huge outpouring of support. Like I want to say like tens of millions of dollars were also being poured into Senate races to, um, by Democrats back to blue to, uh, you know, elect Democrats in seats currently held by Republicans. Yeah, I mean, I'd be curious in Mary's take as a historian and, and you know, tracking trends, but certainly the outpouring of support um, for our organization after the announcement and what we've read in the press about other ways that people are getting involved in donating and showing up. 
you know, people are down at the court leaving mementos and um, and talking about what the death means to them. Um, we've seen people sign up for action alerts. They want to get engaged. They want to get involved. We're actually having a virtual rally at the end of this week to give people an outlet to channel that because we've heard from so many people who want to do something. So there certainly is a lot of energy on the side of people who support abortion rights, but also Justice Ginsburg's broader legacy on sex discrimination and what it means for women to be equal in this country. It's all kind of tied up together. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of outrage and support on the other side. And they really see this as the culmination of a long fought strategic and coordinated battle to win the Supreme Court. Certainly they've taken over a lot of the lower courts. Trump has nominated over 200 judges to the federal lower courts in the years that he's been president. And so um, this is kind of the culmination of that effort is to get conservative anti-abortion justice in place for Justice Ginsburg so that they can finally overturn Roe versus Wade. So um, the other side is geared up and, and certainly our side needs to be too. Yeah, I mean, I think historically it would be fair to say that um, conservatives and anti-abortion or pro-life folks have been probably more concerned about the court and maybe more motivated when it comes to the court at the grassroots level. And I think because Justice Ginsburg was not just a justice to a lot of progressives, he was sort of a hero. Um, that's changed to some degree, right? Um, and so any, um, any Supreme Court nomination would be incredibly motivating to people who are opposed to abortion because it might represent um, a near certainty that Roe would be overturned. But if you're thinking about um, what it would mean to progressives, it's, it's replacing um, a sort of progressive or feminist icon with someone who's going to potentially cast a deciding vote to overturn Roe. And that feels different to a lot of people, which is, I think, why there's more energy, whether you're thinking about organizing or um, donations. And I think also to some degree that's also true because um, I think most conservatives who are being honest recognize that they might have gotten rid of Roe anyway, right? It's not as if, you know, you had John Roberts as some kind of crusading liberal hero, I and mean, that's just not true. So you may be kind of creating an, a, an insurance policy when it comes to things like abortion or the Affordable Care Act, but you, the conservatives might have had those results anyway. Whereas I think for, for progressives losing Justice Ginsburg, there's no speculation there. I mean, that's a kind of tangible, obvious loss. Kind of, it, it reminds me actually of how conservatives were acting after the loss of Antonin Scalia in 2016, which um, in some ways kickstarted this whole process with Merrick Garland being kept off the Supreme Court. But part of the reason that went over the way it did was because Antonin Scalia was an icon on the right in the same way that Ruth Bader Ginsburg is an icon on the left. So um, that's part of the reason I think people are so energized because her legacy means more than just another seat on the Supreme Court. Yeah, I should also note that you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was a huge icon in terms of uh, fighting against sex discrimination and making the 14th Amendment recognize that the Equal Protection Clause should protect women. And you know, as time has gone on, folks of other genders um, from being discriminated against on the basis of sex. And she also, I think, um, to kind of return a little bit to birth control, earlier during the pandemic, she was actually in the hospital at one point for one case, uh, and she called in to defend the uh, birth control provision within the Affordable Care Act, um, which is certainly a moment that I'm sure will appear in any forthcoming biographies of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Um, I'm wondering, Mira, like, I know you're more, much more on the medical side, the healthcare side, less so on, on the policy and activism side in that way, but have you seen a reaction from your patients, a reaction from folks who are associated with Planned Parenthood, Hudson McConnick? Oh, of course. Um, the whole movement has been activated, has been, you know, we're ready, we're charged. And I mean, I my patients always bring up um, anything that's related to sexual reproductive health care that's in the headlines. I mean, access to the, to news and the media is so easy now with our iPhones. And so, you know, I, I'm a physician and I practice medicine, but here I am also having to decode headlines and policies. And, you know, I, I, I don't claim to be an expert, but I do have to be able to talk about it um, in a way that's digestible for my patients. Um, I will say that, um, 
that a lot of colleagues, a lot of friends, we've, you know, we're all geared up to go out there and, you know, encourage people to vote and to support organizations that are working on the ground to improve access. I mean, we're trying to do everything that we can, but yes, there's been over the weekend, there was a, a really big call to action from various groups in the movement. Um, people are awake now. It's interesting. It feels like um, this was an election that was really about the coronavirus. It was about the economy. It was about um, all of the protests that are going on around uh, Black Lives Matter. And now it's kind of returned again to abortion in the same way that Antonin Scalia's death in 2016 also kind of forced that election to be <laughs> election about abortion. Um, I don't know that I have a question at the end of this. It just constantly feels like we're in this loop where at the last moment there's some kind of like, oh, by the way, it was actually all about, it's actually gonna be about abortion yet again. And I'm wondering as folks who are like, you know, in this work, how that feels for you to have this happen. I mean, this time, what, just weeks away from the election. I will, I will say, I think it's important for us um, not to just talk about abortion because people who have abortions don't live single issue lives, right? So they're black people facing the racial injustice, they're immigrants, they're transgender, they're struggling to make ends meet, they're students. So it's important that we situate access to abortion in a broader worldview that really will resonate with people and make them understand how all of these fights are connected. And 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 they know that intuitively, but for us to be able to talk about it that way. And and the Supreme Court as the, you know, the the entity that is deciding these rights for people. And one thing I think Justice Ginsburg was very good at was situating abortion within the broader context of women's lives, what it meant to a woman's equality, what it meant to a woman's dignity, her ability to have the future that she wants to have. And we've lost that on the court. I mean, certainly Justice Sotomayor and others can do it, but she was very, very good at situating it within the broader, um, the broader movement and the broader worldview. And so I think we honor her legacy by trying to build out that broader worldview and trying to connect the issue of abortion to all the other facets of people's lives. I mean, I'm sure Dr. Shaw sees this with her patients, right? That they have all of these things that they're struggling with and abortion is a piece of their their overall lives that they're having to contend with. Yeah, and I think that the reproductive justice movement does this really well, that highlights the, the abortion in the broader context. It's something that I tried to do with my book by highlighting stories of individuals who have had abortions and then just reiterating this idea that that Audre Lorde said so well that, you know, we don't live single issue lives. Um, and that it, we, our lives are incredibly intersectional. So, you know, restricting access to an abortion for one individual may mean that they can't complete school, that they cannot provide for the children that they do already have. Um, and also just highlighting the fact that it's, it is an all gender issue, that it's not just women seeking abortion, that it is trans people, gender non-binary people seeking abortion, and that cis men are also beneficiaries and impacted by abortion, right? Um, so it's a, it's a broader issue than just the actual abortion itself. Um, and as a healthcare provider, it's really hard for me to see this issue become so exploited um, by politicians because it really is healthcare. Um, and, you know, it's, it's just being used for political gain and to buy voters and it's just not fair. And I really think that it's misunderstood and that we need to highlight abortion for what it really is, which is, you know, about social justice. And I think that we are getting there and a lot of the work of my colleagues um is being put on the forefront um and 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 you know i i'm glad that you brought that up because i think it's really important to point out thank you uh, mary i don't know if you have any thoughts on this but i think we're going to draw to a close here and i wanted to kind of give you a, a question that i don't know that historians appreciate but as someone who studies the legal history of reproduction and looking back at history, you know, like what do you think the future holds here? Like what are kind of the things that folks should be watching out for that people should be anticipating? You know, I think the question on everyone's mind about literally what's gonna happen next. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously, I don't know, but I think it's it's a safe assumption that the court is going to, uh, if I were guessing, right, given if you only have one more conservative on the court, the most likely outcome is a rolling back of abortion rights that's hard for most people to understand. Um, and that means that if you care about this issue, really, if you're pro-life or you're pro-choice, you're going to have to pay really close attention. Um, you're not likely to have a court with Brett Kavanaugh or John Roberts writing, you know, crystal clear, you know, obvious, throw down the gauntlet type decisions about abortion or fetal rights, or it's just not likely to happen. So in the near term, we're likely to see a kind of short term scaling back that's going to take a while for people to digest. So if you're active or interested in this issue, you're going to have to read closely and follow the news and not just sort of the headlines because you might miss what's really going on. I think longer term, it's quite possible that we see a complete overturning of Roe. And then it's worth thinking about it, regardless of what you think on this issue about what would happen after that, right? Um, and I think one answer to that is you would have a similar kind of state by state battle to the one we've already seen where you would have fights in Congress, you would have fights in each state legislature. Those battles would be particularly heated in states like Florida, where I am, that are not really red or blue, but somewhere in between. Um, you would see battles in every state Supreme Court. And then you would continue to see efforts in the United States Supreme Court, because of course, one of the lessons of Roe v. Wade is that the Supreme Court has not and cannot settle this issue, right? So if the court is to overturn Roe, it's not as if pro-choice groups are gonna just take their toys and go home, right? They're gonna, there's gonna be an ongoing effort to reestablish a federal constitutional right to abortion. So I think um, if you're pro-choice, it's easy to feel demoralized or afraid right now. And if you're pro-life, it's probably easy to feel confident or victorious. And if you take the kind of long view of the history, um, American abortion politics are sort of endless. Right? There's no, there's no point at which one side wins and it's done. Um, and so that means if you're thinking about the state of abortion rights, you, you really have to be thinking in terms of, you know, decades if not centuries, not in terms of a, a year or two. So, regardless of what the Supreme Court has to say about Roe, the conflict will continue. You know, in your state legislature, in Congress and in the Supreme Court, and, and that will probably go on indefinitely. So if you're interested in this issue, um, really on either side, there's lots you can do, um, including voting, and there will be lots you can do indefinitely because the conflict will probably continue indefinitely. So it sounds like you're saying, regardless of where you stand on this issue, pay attention and don't just read headlines, read articles, which as a journalist is something yeah, that I can get <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think, um, and I think in the near term, especially just because um, there are some people like Claire, if Clarence Thomas ran the Supreme Court, there would be a nice, clear opinion saying, you know, Roe v. Wade is trash and the people who wrote Roe v. Wade are, are racist, eugenicists, and, you know, women having abortion are racist and eugenicists, and maybe that there's a right to life, but it would be really, really easy to understand. Like Clarence Thomas is not trying to confuse you. That's not what he's going to do. But someone like Roberts or Kavanaugh, they're much more cunning and they have conflicting goals. And so if you're looking at someone who's writing an opinion, who's concerned about backlash, but committed to dismantling abortion rights, you're going to get an opinion that's hard to understand. And so regardless of where you stand on this issue, if you want to know what's going on and what you can and can't do either in terms of you know actual concrete abortion care or abortion politics or advocacy you're going to need to pay really close attention in the months and years to come um well on that note i did want to just mention one last statistic which is that if roe v wade were to be overturned the center for reproductive rights which supports abortion rights which argued the june medical services v russo case earlier this year does believe that about half of the states in this country would try to prohibit uh, abortion. So on that note, I wanna thank all of you again for coming. We were joined by Dr. Mira Shaw, by Mary Ziegler, by Gretchen Borset. I really appreciate all of your insight um, and knowledge on this topic. So thank you again. Yeah, thank thanks you. for having us. Thanks for having us. I think this is...